Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day, 200th video. <laughs> Today we are looking at a data set of images of people, um, and we're going to try to predict the age from an image. So normally when you're using image uh, data, you're doing some sort of image classification or object detection. But today we're actually going to be doing a regression task based on the images. So we're going to use the name of the folder as an uh, integer value on a continuous scale for predicting the age of the person in a given image. So let's hop into the notebook. We're going to be using NumPy, Pandas, uh, the path object from pathlib, and os.path for working with the data. For pre-processing, we'll use the train test split function from sklearn. Then for building our image data generators and the model itself, we'll be using TensorFlow. And we'll evaluate the performance of the model with the R-squared score. So let's go ahead and import all of that. Um, and the first thing I want to do is get the name of the folder uh, that we're using uh, that contains all of our images. So we're going to be using this 20 to 50 data set just because it has fewer images uh, we have to load up. Uh, so we're going to be trying to predict uh, the age of people ages 20 to 50. Now I'm not going to worry about the train test split they gave us already. I'm going to use all the images both in train and test. So I'm just going to use this as the folder 20 to 50 here. So I'm going to call this image dir, and uh, there we go. Now I don't want to leave it just as a string. I'm actually going to turn it into a path object from pathlib, which allows us to do some nice operations on it. Uh, then we'll go ahead and create our file data frame. So the, t the file data frame uh, is what we're going to use to flow the images from the disk into our model. Uh, we're going to use flow from data frame from the Keras image data generator. And uh, the file data frame just has to contain one column with the file paths and one column with the uh, target values associated with each image. So if we take imager, which is a pathlib path object, and use the glob function, we can actually use glob expressions to find images in uh, the directory. So I'm going to use the expression star star slash star dot jpeg. What this is saying is anything you find, uh, regardless of directories, uh, this can contain subdirectories just as long as the final result is something dot jpeg. So this is essentially saying find all images recursively through the whole uh, directory subtree. So if we run this, it's actually just a generator object. So I'm going to turn it into a list to get back the list of file paths. Um, and we might as well turn it into a pandas series since we're going to use it in a data frame. So we'll give this a name. The name of the column here will be file path. All right, and let's store this in file paths. OK, um, so that might just take a moment while it goes and gets all of them. We'll check it out here. OK, and we can see we now have the file paths every image in ImageDir. Now, I also want the ages. And you can see that the age is actually given by the parent folder, parent directory of the image file. So if we take one of these, let's say file paths dot value sub zero, we take the first file path, it's a POSIX path. Um, we can actually use os.path.split OS on this. Um, and that will split off the file name from the rest of the, the file path. And we want this value. So we're going to discard the file name. We're going to take the first value here. And then we're going to split it again. os.path.split. Uh, and that will split off the value we want. And we'll take the second value to get back that age. And we'll do this for every element in our file paths. So file paths.apply a lambda function. Now for every x in the series, that will be one of these, we return os.path.split of os.path.split of x. Um, but we have to make sure that we take the first element of this one and the second element of this one. And that will give us back the objects as strings, uh, give, give us back all the ages as strings. So we then should turn it into a NumPy or integer uh, data type with as type. All right, and let's call this ages. Um, so we'll make this into a pandas series uh, just with the name being age. 
Uh, oh, I, this should be like that. Okay. Okay. I have to put the. Oh my god. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. All right. So now ages is also a series um, of integers for each file path. So we'll combine these together, put these up here, and we'll use pandas, duck, and cat. Uh, actually, I should turn the file paths into strings. So as type string, TensorFlow will require that later. We're gonna concatenate together the file paths and the ages side by side, so axis one. Um, and I'll call this images. So if we take a look at images, once that complete, uh, you can see we have 40,000 images, each with a file path and an age associated with it. So uh, we have our data frame. Um, however, I don't want to use all 40,000 images just because it will be very slow training. So why don't we, yeah, let's, let's uh, only use 5,000 images to speed up training time. So image df, that's going to be, uh, we're going to create an image df from images. That will be images.sample 5000. And we'll include a random state of 1. So something I noticed, um, we actually have not shuffled this data. So why don't we go back up here and shuffle this data first with sample uh, fraction 1.0. So this is saying sample 100% of the data without replacement, which is the same as a shuffle. We'll include a random state so we can reproduce the results. Uh, however, you'll see the indices have been shuffled, so let's reset the index. Drop equals true. All right, so now down here, we just want to take 5,000 of the images. So we'll take 5,000 with the sample function and then also reset the index. So image df is just 5,000 of our original images. Okay, however, I do want a train and test set. So we're gonna create train df and test df with the train test split function for mesklearn. We pass in image df and specify the train size. How much of the data do we want for our train set? Let's make a 70%. Uh, so this will also shuffle the data and then we'll include a random state to ensure the shuffle is always done in the same way. So we run this. Um, now train df should just be, uh, yeah, so that's 70% of the original 5,000, and then test df would be the, the other, uh, the other ones. Okay, so I'll just leave that on there. All right, so now let's start loading in the images. So we're going to create, we're going to use uh, Keras's image data generator for this. That's tf.keras.preprocessing dot image dot image data generator so in here you can specify any transforms you want to apply to the images um, so we're not going to do any data augmentation today but we are going to apply a rescale so the pixel values will be uh, between 0 and 255 so by rescaling it by a factor of 1 over 255 we're sending all the values to be between 0 and 1 which is nice for the model we should always do that before uh, training and we'll include a validation split. Uh, so we're going to be taking our validation data uh, also using the same generator. So we'll include this here. So I'll call this train generator. We're then going to copy this over, create another one called test generator. Only difference is we don't need a validation split here. All right, so now um, we're going to flow the data, flow the images through the generator. So we take our train generator and we're going to call flow from data frame. Um, and we specify a data frame here. So the, the data frame we want to flow from is our train df, which we created, which is just for the train set. Uh, then our x column is the file path column. So if we look at train df here, this is going to be our x column. So file path. And our y column is going to be the age then our target size. So I'm, I'm going to reduce the resolution of the images down to 120 by 120. 
uh, so that we can speed up the training time. And this will perform the resize for us. Then our color mode uh, will be RGB. So that's because we have three color channels. Uh, they are color images. And our class mode. This one's important. when you're, Because we're doing a regression task here, uh, we want to specify the class mode as raw so that the it's saying to the generator, don't do anything with the classes, leave it just as it is, and we'll use it to explicitly compare to our ages, um, our predicted ages. OK, so batch size. Uh, we can specify batch size here so that we don't have to do it later in our model. Then shuffle equals true, because we always want to shuffle training data. Our seed can be 42. Uh, that will ensure the shuffle is always done in the same way. And we'll also have a subset, which is training. And this is saying, well, look at our validation split and then take the train set. So let's call this train images. So this is sort of like a specification for how to flow the data. And we'll create another one called val images, which is identical uh, because we're using the same generator, same data frame. Only difference is the subset becomes validation. Uh, and by setting the seed, we can ensure that the training and validation sets are always the same. Lastly, we're going to create our test images. This one is going to be a new generator. Uh, we're using test test generator now, and we're flowing from test df. Uh, another difference: we don't need a subset, we don't need a seed, and we're not going to shuffle. Uh, we don't shuffle the test because we want. We're just going to be evaluating it. I'm not going to be using it for training. So let's run this. All right, we have 2,800 train images, 700 validation images, and 1,500 test images. So we'll start training. We're going to create a convolutional neural network. So let's create an input layer with tf.keras.input. And this is just the shape of our original image. So it'll be 120 by 120 by 3. Then our first layer will be a convolutional layer, tf.keras.layers.conf2d, two-dimensional convolutional layer. Um, so convolutional layers basically they look at regions of the image by sliding a window across it and extracting features, uh, new features from the image. So the filters is saying how many full passes over the image do we want. So I'll make it 16. Um, the kernel size, so, so for each filter we're generating a new two-dimensional feature, you can think of it that way. Um, and then the kernel size is how big is the window that's going across that contains our weights. So the weights in the kernel are multiplied with the pixel values to return the output of the convolutional layer as a two-dimensional uh, set of features. <coughs> okay, uh, or a set of two-dimensional features I should say. Okay, so uh, kernel size is 3 by 3. Uh, that's pretty standard, and we'll give it a ReLU activation. Then we'll pass in inputs here, and I'm just, uh, so after this, uh, so if we look at X, we run this, see X, uh, you can see our original inputs uh, were, was 120 by 120 by 3, uh, and we lost two pixels on, uh, on each side. That's just due to the 3 by 3 window. It, it's not going off the side of the image, so we lose one pixel on each side of the uh, of the uh, of each dimension, and now we have 16 new two-dimensional features, each of size 118 by 118. Now, uh, common practice is to reduce to to downsample this data using a max pooling, tf.keras.layers.maxpool 2d. Pass in x. If we look at x after that, um, you can see it has been downsampled to 59 by 59. And that just slides another window across, taking the max of each window uh, to reduce the size of the image. Then we'll copy this over, do the same thing, but set this one to 32 and change this to X. Um, and this is basically extracting features from the features. So this one extracts features from the original image, 16 new two-dimensional features. And this one extracts 32 two-dimensional features from these, uh, from from this output, these downsampled original features, and so we're trying to take features that are useful for uh, creating, uh, for making predictions about age. So, um, 
after that, if we look at x after this, we're left with this final output of 28 by 28 by 32. So we have 32 two-dimensional features, each of size 28 by 28. And these two-dimensional features, we hope, are very rich in information about, uh, about what's useful in the image concerning uh, the age of the person. Uh, however, it is three-dimensional right now, and we'd like to bring it down into one dimension. So one way we could do this is with tf.keras.layers.flatten. Uh, we pass x in, and you see that will just multiply 28 by 28 by, 20 by 32 to flatten it out all into one uh, vector. However, uh, this is sometimes too many features, so it might be better to use global average pooling 2D. And what that'll do is instead it'll average across the first two dimensions, just give us this final 32 features, um, single, single number features. Uh, we could also do global max pooling if we wanted, which would just take the max across the first two dimensions. We'll keep it with average, and I'll plug that in here. Um, so now, uh, this output of our model is just 32 values. And so we can think of these values as the new features to use. Now we have 32 useful features, so we hope they're useful. Uh, we can just do a proper uh, two hidden layer neural network like we usually do. So that would be tf.harris.layers.dense. Maybe we'll give it 64 neurons. Uh, ReLU activation. And then pass in X. And just copy that over one more time. And then we'll have our outputs. That will be tf.keras.layers.dense. And we're outputting only one value with a linear activation. That means no activation, since it's a regression task. And we'll pass in x. Then our model is going to be tf.keras.model. The inputs are given as inputs, and the outputs are given as outputs. All right, and we'll compile the model using model.compile. The optimizer here will be Adam. The last function will be MSE, mean squared error, since it's a regression task. And we'll store the results in history. So that's model.fit. We're fitting on the trains, uh, train images. Uh, and our validation data is going to be val images. We'll train for 100 epochs with the early stopping callback. So that's uh, tf.harris.callbacks.early stopping. Uh, and this will look at a value. We'll give it the validation loss to look at. And we'll give it a patience value. And say 5. This says after the validation loss stops improving for 5 consecutive epochs, it will stop the training and restore the weights from the best epoch. All right, so we'll run that. Um, and while that trains, let us get some results. So uh, for the results, we want to get a set of predictions. So we'll say predicted ages. Uh, and that will be model.predict test images. Now, usually I take the argmax of this or something when it's classification setting uh, so that we can get the classifications. But um, in this case, it's a single output, uh, linear output. So this is actually the value we want. So we're going to leave it right as it is. The output of the model is the prediction. And the only thing I do want to do is squeeze this so we remove the extra dimension. As this comes as a two-dimensional uh, set of predictions, we want it as one-dimensional. So numpy.squeeze will do that for us. Then we'll get the true ages. And this will just come from the labels, uh, test images.labels. So it's they're not technically labels since it's a regression task. They're target values. Uh, but labels is how you get, get them. All right, so then let's get the root mean squared error for the test set. So we can do that with model.evaluate on test images for both equals zero, so we don't see the loading bar. Um, and that will return the mean squared error. So we then want to take the square root of that to get the root mean squared error. We'll call that RMSE, and we'll print this out. Test RMSE. Uh, we'll display this to five decimal places and format that with RMSE. Then we'll get the R squared score. Uh, so we can use the R squared R2 score function from sklearn to do this. We just have to pass in the true ages and the predicted ages. 
All right, we'll call that R2. And we'll print it out as well. So test R squared score. And we'll display this to five decimal places. Format it, format it with R2. Just indent this over. Um, I'll see how this is doing. Uh, I will resume the video when this completes. All right, so the training completed. And let's get the results. I should just take a moment. All right, um, and as you can see, uh, we have a an RMS E of nine. So uh, if you think about the unit of mean squared error, MSE, uh, that's the difference in prediction and, and a real uh, value, uh, which in this case is age or year, um, squared. So it's squared years. If we take the square root uh, with of, of the MSE, we get back the unit into years. So you can think of our MSE as sort of a, on what's our average error in years? We, we're, we're on average, we're nine years off in every prediction. And that's not really so good, right? Nine years off uh, when we're dealing with a range of 20 to 50 is, is quite substantial. So the R squared score, um, R squared score is a measure of, all right, if you take the, the null model or the baseline model, the baseline model is predict the mean every time. Baseline model is what model do we use when we have no training data available to us? We just have the targets. Then we just take the mean of the targets, and that's our best guess. The R squared score is um, basically saying, if you take that baseline model and plot the distribution of errors across all training examples, um, and then you take our model and plot the distribution of errors, what's the percent reduction from the null model, the baseline model, to our model. So in the best case, we have an R squared score of 1.0, which is a 100% reduction. That means the very, uh, sorry, I should say it's the percent uh, percent reduction in the variance of the error distribution. Uh, so in, with, when we have an R squared score of 1.0, that means a 100% reduction in variance. That means the whole distribution just becomes no, no error. And when there's zero error, we have a R squared score of 1.0. <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, we could have really bad variance when we have a lot of error. Uh, in that case, we can have a negative R squared score when it's even worse than the baseline model. And so here you can see we do have a negative score. It's slightly negative. This is saying it's basically our, our model is slightly worse than the baseline model. And we can verify this here. Um, if we take the mean, the numpy dot mean, of the true ages, this is the mean. Uh, without any training data available, this would be our best guess. So if we then calculate the RMSE for the baseline model, um, if we take the true ages and always subtract the mean, these are the errors um, or the errors for each value, uh, and then we square it, that's to get the squared. So that's squared error, and we take the mean squared error by summing them all together and dividing by the length of true ages. Now will give us the mean squared error. Then we take the square root of this to get the, the RMSE. And you can see that our RMSE is slightly better than our model's RMSE. And so that's what the R squared score is reflecting. All right, so uh, that will sum up today's video. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.